morning. Good morning. How y'all doing this morning? Outstanding. Amen. Well, uh, I want to give a thanks to uh, Jonathan, bro. Thank you so much for putting this order of service together. And uh, and thank you, Tyree. I know he's not here, but he's definitely watching, or will be watching this. But thank you, bro, for allowing me to preach this morning. Uh, something that I really learning to do. Amen. Come on. Come on, uh, you know, we have uh, we have three guys coming up today. It's myself, Jonathan, and the Costa. And you know, we're gonna talk about maybe different topics, but combine together a topic of freedom in Christ. Come on. Oh, oh. You know, we were talking with Jonathan and I were talking about this topic or this title. All week I was asking myself these three questions. Thank you. What is freedom in Christ? All right. What does freedom in Christ look like? And for me, am I living like someone that has found freedom in Christ? Amen. You know, all week I've been asking myself these three questions, and it's been a challenge to even understand where I stand as a disciple, as a man of God. I got baptized on September 16, 2012, and it hasn't been easy. Life as a Christian is hard. It's hard when sometimes the worst enemy is yourself. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing stopping me from being spiritual or a spiritual warrior is myself. Come on, bro. You know, I studied with so many people. I studied the Bible with so many people. And some of the honest excuses I hear is, I'm just too lazy. Mm -hmm. And others like, sorry, I'm just too busy. Yep. I have work. Mm. Or the famous one, it's okay. God knows my heart. Oh. It's crazy, right? <laughs> to see how much freedom we have in this world <laughs> to do whatever we want. My first point and only point, the freedom in Christ came with a price. Wow. You know, we just finished celebrating 4th of July. It's I think it's, gonna, it's turning into one of my favorite holidays now. You know, we, we, we celebrate freedom from being governed or ruled by another country. Yeah. It's a day that we celebrate freedom in this country. It came with a price. The, the Revolutionary War that lasted eight years had almost 300,000 deaths. Wow. Lots of deaths, lots of blood was, was shed for our independence, right? That same freedom we can also find in Christ. Blood was shed. That's right. Come on, bro. Freedom from slavery of sin. Mm -hmm. Freedom from worries, stress, panic attacks. I've had one. On, Being bro. judged from other people. I feel judged. Mm -hmm. yep. Fake who you're pretending to be. I faked it. Yeah, Faking the funk, like you say, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How do we hold to this freedom and how do we get it? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have, have eternal life. Yeah. The world ha and even mega churches believe in this scripture and find so much freedom in this scripture alone. This is their go to scripture. To make themselves feel like they're free about living life just the way they want to. Right. John 3.16 on bu bumper stickers. Right? <laughs> I see no. I think that we had one. <laughs> Not myself, but my dad. Uh, <laughs> Probably one of the famous scriptures I've I've uh, you know I've seen in wrestling, you know, John 3.16, right? Wow. But this freedom in Christ came with a price. Turn with me to Romans 8, Come on, verses bro. 1 through 4. Uh, you know, this is where I found the answer to that I was asking myself. What is freedom in Christ? Mm -hmm. Romans 8 verse 1 says, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives us life set you free from the law of sin and death. And the uh, NLT version says, because you belong to him, the power of life, giving spirit, has freed you. Verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh. God this, did this, God did by sending his own son in the likeness 
of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the new law might be fully met in us. Who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Condemnation. You know, I really had to really study this word out a little bit and really understand what it meant. There is no condemnation for us who claim to be in Christ because God knows we deserve total punishment. Amen. Amen. Condemnation comes from the Hebrew word krino. Its proper word in, also kind of relates to, to conflict loss. Upon a person to condemn in modern English now refers to it, internal punishment. Eternal punishment. You know, we are being freed by obtaining the, the Spirit of God that comes through Jesus Christ. And that gives us freedom. Freedom from sin. Yep. It says here in verse 3 that the law was powerless because of our flesh. Mm. You can have a form of godliness, right? Yeah. But no power yeah. without the Spirit. What does freedom in Christ look like? One other question that I was asking myself all week. Well, verse 4. God sent Jesus, his only son, to be an example for us. An example, he became flesh. He became like you and I. Mm -hmm. He became an example that we too can live a righteous life. So that we don't live accordingly to the flesh, but according to the spirits. It's supposed to look like us not living accordingly to the flesh, but by the Spirit. Living by the Spirit requires us to stay in prayer. It requires us to read the Bible. Yep. It requires us to not live in our own emotions. Putting the flesh to death. Mm. Come on, living by the Spirit, worshiping, right? Come on. Singing. Yeah. One of our song leaders this morning came, man, what's, what's going on this morning with the singing? Huh? I thought it too. <laughs> and I want to apologize for that, bro. On, you know, loving one another, right? Yeah. But when we live according to the flesh, because I've been there, I took notes yeah. of myself, right? Come on, bro. Galatians 5.19 specifically says that, that the acts of the sin for nature are obvious, That's right? right yeah. yeah. How did you walk in this morning? Woo. It's obvious. Uh, okay. How did you walk in this morning? Yeah. Were you grateful? Were you grateful to be here, or you just came here not knowing why you're here? Come on. Come on. Mm. With an attitude. Woo. I've been there. I got a set of the AP. <laughs> that was me in the past, honestly. But that yeah. serving kept me faithful. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Serving kept me faithful. You know, when a downcast face, I've seen that before. And brothers and sisters. And it's my fault for not calling you out, amen? Right. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. It's obvious. We are not free. It was, it was living in the flesh, right? Mm. right. Sure. There's a story I want to read. President Abraham Lincoln signed up. Bear with me. Emancipation? Emancipation. Oh, Emancipation. There you go. Whatever gotcha. they say. <laughs> on September 22nd, 1962, the moment it went into effect, January 1st, 1863, every slave living in the Confederacy was legally free. They were free. But until they knew about their freedom, the legal fact had no impact in their lives. Wow. Nothing. Check this out. But until the Union soldiers carried hundreds and thousands of copies of the proclamation and passed them out as they made their way through the South during the war, that's when they knew they were free. Wow. Sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> Christ has set us free from the power of sin. Wow. We must recognize the fact yeah. and live like it. Yeah. Come on, bro. You know, like I said, um, I passed. <laughs> like I said, uh, 4th of July has been. <laughs> Come on, bro. Um, 4th of July has been an awesome, awesome 
feeling sometimes. I think uh, this year was probably one of the best years I've had at 4th of July, and it's just amazing, right? We had barbecues, right? Family time. Blessed to not be at work that day. Yes. <laughs> right? And I put my phone away that day. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna put my phone away. I felt free. Mm. No worries. Nothing. But spiritually, was I free? Right? I was free living life. I loved it. I was like, man, this is awesome, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes real freedom comes from what? Christ, right? right? Mm -hmm. He gives us that total freedom. That's right. That yeah. we need. You know, the, ask, the questions that I was asking myself this, this week, you know, what, what is freedom or how does that look like? Mm -hmm. The final question is, is something that I want you guys to ask yourselves. My challenge for, for you guys is, if you're a disciple, am I living like someone that has found freedom in Christ? And for those who are visiting, amen, do I want to live free from this world and find freedom in Christ? Come on, bro. Come on. You know, study the Bible with the person who brought you out, and surely that freedom that comes from Christ will set you free. I love you guys. Thank you so much. Mario, great job, brother. Hey, excuse yeah. the laptop family. I'm going to work to preach without this, but bear with me this morning. Well, good morning. My name is Jonathan Franklin. Excited on, to speak with you all today. Yeah. We got a long way to go, not a lot of time, so let's dive right into it. Um, you know, when I played running back for the Green Bay Packers, uh, prior, prior to each game, I would get what is called a scouting report. And this report will be a breakdown of the opposing team defense. Ooh. And the purposes of this report for me was for me to understand my opponent, but also the tendencies as well, so I can recognize it when they do it. Mm. And the goal of my opponents were to stop me from scoring, right. prevent me from having a good game, and ultimately did. prevent the team from winning. Right. Yes, for example, when I played for the Packers, we were going against the Detroit Lions. And the scatter report that I got was about a player by the name of Nadama Kinsu. Oh. Yeah. And on this, on this paper, it was 6'4", 315 pounds. Yeah. And it shared every position that he lined up in, what he was going to do, and that how that position was only to disrupt what the team and I were doing. Yeah. Right. And the reality family, we have opposition. Yeah. And they're not stopping us from winning a football game, but yet they're stopping us from living and embracing that freedom in Christ Come the on. way that God wants us to. And today, I want to give you a brief scouting report of the opponents that we face. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. I'm going to just read it real quick, quickly for us. Galatians 5, verse 1, the Bible reads, it says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And the reality is we have opponents that want us to keep up, want to keep us enslaved. And our three opponents that we're going to talk about today is Satan, the world, and our flesh. The title of my lesson is Becoming Equipped to Live in Freedom. Point number one, recognizing Satan's tactics. Let's go to Genesis chapter three. Come on, bro. Come on, Jonathan. Amen. Y'all with me? Yeah. Go with Genesis chapter, chapter three, verse one. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. Yep. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Okay. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gain and wisdom, she took some and ate it. So we see Eve is having a conversation with the serpent. And there is some persuasion done by the serpent that successfully leads Eve astray. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I were to ask all of you who the serpent was, I'm sure you would say the devil or Satan. Yeah. But interesting enough, as you and I just read the scripture, nowhere in the text does is a serpent identified as Satan. Wow. Wow. In fact, in order to fully understand that the serpent was Satan, you have to go to the last book of the Bible. Wow. 
In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it talks about the fall of Satan. Wow. It talks about how he's the great dragon, the ancient serpent, identified as the devil or Satan who wants to lead the whole world astray. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we don't learn that the serpent is the devil until later. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Because for the most part, you don't realize that it was Satan attacking you until after the fact. Oh Contextually in Genesis, there was nothing letting Eve know that she was speaking to the devil. Right. Nothing that made her aware that she was having a conversation with Satan. Wow. And why didn't he make it known? Because Satan is intentional. Right. In verse 1, it says the serpent is more craftier than any of the wild animals. And the word crafty means skillful and Clever in achieving by deceit. And the word deceit is an act causing someone to accept as true or invalid what is false or invalid. So what that means is Satan is skillful and clever in convincing you to believe what's wrong is right and what's false is true. And he can do that better than anything or anyone in the world. And the biggest trick of Satan is to get us all to believe that he doesn't exist and he can't lead us astray, yet he's alive and very active. Right. Satan is described as an adversary, a constant enemy of God, a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Second Timothy talks about how he has taken man captive to do his will. Yeah. Satan is described as the father of lies. Satan is against God's children's effort who are aiming to conform to God's will and God's righteous standards. And he will do whatever he can to prevent us from living and being who God's called us to be. That's right, bro. We see he deceived Eve here in Genesis, causing her to look at God's word different and believe that she can question and negotiate the standard of God's word. And our, our opposition family, known as Satan, is the father of lies, as it says in John 8. And he comes time and time again to get you to question the truth of who the Bible calls you to be right. and who God says you should be as well. That's it, right. He works to influence doubts in your minds. He creates hesitations to prolong you to, to surrender things so you can't do God's will. That's right. He leads you to question if you're ready to be used, can, if you can become a vessel, if you can serve. He distracts you to see that there's freedom in Christ. Come on. Our first opposition goal is to lead us astray, to never freely live in Christ the way God wants us to. But let's learn about our second opponent. The point here is who do you love? First John chapter two, verse 15. We're gonna learn about the world here. So verse 15, first John chapter two, verse 15, it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, anyone, the love of the father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. We see what the world creates in our lives. The craving, the desires, the boasting about oneself, the lust. And each of these is a byproduct produced of the love we have from the world. And the word love here is referred to as that agape love. The self-sacrificing love. The world deceives us to believe that we think we should have for it. The world tells us we should sacrifice everything to get what we want, and we should sacrifice everything to go after the things we believe we deserve. Wow. The world tells you you've been through much to not have that house. That you, you suffer too much to ha not have that financial breakthrough. Woo. To build your security and finances. On, you have to break the cycle in your family. You're one decision away. You're one year away from hard work. Uh, you, you're, you're one decision away from just building everything in the world for the world to notice who you are. And the world lures us and craves us to focus on the money, the wealth, and success, and we no longer crave God and getting closer to Him. Yeah. Come on, bro. The world can lead us to a pathway to building our success first, and the pathway to heaven comes second. Come and our freedom in Christ is, is then lost due to us becoming a slave to the world. Wow. The question is for you this morning is, what are you rooted in, and why do you do the things that you do? Is your, is your desire to find comfort in the world stronger than your desire to serve God? Are you sacrificing more to accomplish your dreams in the world than you are sacrificing what is necessary to be used by God and get to heaven? Let's go to James 4 real quickly here. James chapter 4, verse 4. The Bible reads, it says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? 
Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And it talks about this concept of friendship with the world. And the term friendship means philos, philia. And it's the concept of love and being loved. It ultimately suggests an affectionate relationship. And our close relationship with the world can put us in opposition with God. And when you think about relationships, what do we get from it? We get comfort. We get reassurance. We receive this sense of belonging. We feel valued. And if your relationship with the world is providing you these things, then you just may be too close. Wow. And there's nothing wrong with success, wealth, owning a home. But are you sacrificing more for the world than you are for God and convinced that it's right? Oh, come on. Our second opposition to the world wants to distract us from embracing our freedom in Christ. Let's go to our final point. It's the battle within. Come on, bro. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Come on, bro. The Bible reads, it says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. And we see this conflict of the flesh and the spirit. They're in contrary to each other. And contrary in the Greek is anti-amahi. It means to lie or to be against. And Paul shares for profoundly that our flesh is contrary to the spirit. And we know we receive the spirit through baptism. Amen. Amen. And our flesh wants to do everything opposite of what God desires for us. The helper and counselor known as the spirit that God provides for us to do his will, our flesh is, comp is in conflict with that. Mm -hmm. And conflict means to fight, to be against. Yeah. So every day we're at a, we're at a battle with the spirit That's that right. may be inside of us. And the reality, what, what does our flesh want? It wants the immorality, the impurity, the bitterness, the anger, the pride, to be praised, to be rooted in selfishness, to keep a record of wrong, to cut people off. Yeah. Our flesh wants to find comfort in fear, although we weren't given the spirit of fear. Come on. And yes, we know we're weak. That's not the problem. The problem is sometimes we don't know how weak we truly are. Come on. Our flesh can lead us to remain enslaved to the world. Our flesh can lead us to be in a vulnerable position to be attacked by Satan. And our flesh can ens enslave us to our own pleasures while the spirit is given for us to have freedom in Christ. Mm -hmm. But unless we recognize the daily battle between the two, it'll be tough to win. Yeah. Right. Family, today we have our spiritual scatter report of the opponents that we face every day. Satan, the world, and our flesh. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And, I, and I share these scatter reports not so we can be defeated, but yet now so we can, one, recognize that we have opponents every day. Yeah. And two, understand the tendencies so it can really birth freedom in the life living in Christ. Mm -hmm. So let's recognize Satan's tactics. Let's love God over the world. And let's master our flesh every day so we can embrace that freedom. My encouragement, my challenge is to create a list, including one thing you need to do in order to overcome Satan, your love of the world, and to master your flesh. To God be the Lord. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Hey man, good morning family. I'm your host to Colin Moore. Uh, thank you so much Mario and Jonathan for those sermons. Uh, I'm over here trying to get notes and everything. I'm like, uh, but uh, I'm so grateful to be able to preach the word alongside these wonderful men who I look up to so much. Mario working so hard, Jonathan his example in so many different ways. So I'm truly honored and humbled to be able to speak with you guys all here today. And if I could be honest, when I was given the topic of freedom in Christ, I was I was a little shocked that I had never studied it out. And so throughout the whole week, I was looking into it, trying to figure out what it was, only to find out I didn't actually know what it meant. And I was like, wow, like all the things that I have believed freedom in Christ was, it actually was not true. And so I was grateful for this sermon uh, to, to be able to preach this because it, it taught me something, helped me to learn. And it also really cut me and convicted me. Uh, and you know, today I really want to hit on the false sense of freedom that exists in Christendom today Ooh. and where it can lead us. The title of our lesson today is The Delusion of Freedom, amen? And I'm so grateful uh, to get some definitions right there from Jonathan. I love definitions, you'll learn that as I speak. I love to hear some definitions. Uh, but the, the, the definition of the delusions are defined as fixed 
false beliefs that conflict with reality, right? Despite contrary evidence, a person in a state of delusion can't let go of these convictions that they believe. And you know, Jesus and his word always removed those delusions from people's lives. Amen? Amen. Let's remove some this morning. Amen? Let's go over to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. And in Luke chapter 13, starting in verse 10, Bubba reads, On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hand on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work. So come and be healed on those days not the Sabbath. The Lord answered him, you hypocrites. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all the opponents were humiliated. But the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Come on, bro. You know, Jesus is teaching here, and it says he calls forth a woman who had been crippled for 18 years. And this is a little bit peculiar, and the, the reason why is because most of the time people would be coming to Jesus asking him to be healed. But in this case, Jesus caused this lady forward to be healed. With, with unbeknownst to her and anybody else, he calls her forward and he heals her. And I, the reason why I feel that's a little peculiar because I think that Jesus had a point he was trying to make here. Huh. And that's why he did this. You know, something to, to, to note is this woman's devotion. You can imagine being hunched over for 18 years. And yet she was still devoted to God, regardless of her physical being. She didn't let, let anything stand in the way. She clearly didn't allow it to stop her from worshiping God. That's why she was there on the Sabbath. Right. And had she not been there, had she allowed that to become an excuse, she would have not been set free from this ailment. Oh, and that's really an encouragement to us, right? Not to allow anything to step in the way of our relationships with God. But immediately after Jesus heals this woman, here comes the synagogue with an attitude. Yeah. You know? Like, hey, you can't be healing on the Sabbath. But he missed the power of God. Because he was so caught up in his roles and his traditions. Isn't that how the religious world is today? Yeah. Caught up in roles, traditions consumed in keeping the status quo, rather than getting into people's lives and helping them to change and to truly be set free the way that Jesus wants them to be. Come on, bro. You know, people go to church week after week faithfully so that they can be free from their spiritual infirmities just like this woman was trying to be free from her physical infirmity. Interestingly enough, the synagogue leader had no problem with the woman being enslaved to this, 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 uh, this infirmity in her life until Jesus came and freed her. Right. There was yeah. nothing, 18 years didn't say anything to this woman. Right. And now he has an attitude. Come on. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Damn. I mean, how many people are just like this lady? Maybe some are here in church today. Yeah. In this very room, right? We go to church weekly. Bounce from church to church, go from revival to revival, from Bible study to Bible study, and still addicted to drugs and alcohol. Come on. Addicted to porn and masturbation enslaved to immoral relationships, enslaved to hate and a lack of forgiveness. And all they truly long for is to be free from these things so that they can share in the freedom in Christ that the word of God speaks about. All this is just truly a lack of biblical leadership in Christendom today. 
People go from altar call to altar call, right? Praying Jesus into the heart, and yet have the hearts full of bitterness and envy. They scream, Jesus is Lord! And go home to scream and curse at their spouse. This is not the way. Come on, bro. It is not. True discipleship, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Acts chapter 2, verse 22 to 36. Repentance and baptism, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. If it's not all these things together, amen, then there is no way to reach a true freedom in Christ. Jesus said it in John 8, 31 to 32. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I think of my life. Right? I spent many years in my life very privileged, and therefore became very selfish and very self-focused. Addicted to pornography, to masturbation, to immorality, drugs and alcohol, right? Putting my life at risk, my family's life at risk because I wanted to have a good time. Right. I almost killed my nephew because of this recklessness. And yet when I started studying the Bible and I started deciding, hey, I want to change my life. I want to be set free from these things. All of a sudden my family came out of nowhere. Wait, you've already been baptized. You, you were baptized as a child. Why, why are you trying to become this disciple? Why, why do you want to change your life now? Mm. Friends, right? Start yeah. cutting me off. Yeah. Because I no longer want to do the things that they did. Ooh. I'm like, well, why now all of a sudden, when my life was in ruins, nobody said anything? Right. But now that I'm trying to change my life, here you are. Now you're concerned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come on, bro. But that's just the truth of the lost world of Christianity today. It's very deceit. It's very delusional. They don't truly know what it means to be free in Christ. And if you don't believe me that this is the case, study the Bible. I guarantee you start to change your life for God. People are going to come out of nowhere yeah. trying to stop you. Yeah. Trying to deceive you. Come on, trying to keep you from doing what God has called you to do. Come on. You know, guys, in conclusion, I want us to be reminded that true freedom in Christ is not found in religiosity. But it is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. I love you guys. Hey! Good morning, everybody. Let's tap it up for all the